Uh, ben, thank you very much for the kind introduction and I'm really happy to be with you today and to, uh, to contribute to this lecture series. Um, at, from the title you can see that the social deserves some particular attention and uh, this is something I would like to, to draw your attention uh, to today. Um, ignorance in social networks. So what I'm trying to do is expand the concept of social networks a little bit from what has conventionally been used uh, in the last years. Uh, and by this I mean the, the kind of social networks that everyone is familiar today, the LinkedIn's and Twitter's and Facebook's of this world. So social networks have become an extremely popular means in the last one or two decades in order to communicate, to get in touch with people, to get connected to people. Um, but basically this has not always been the case. And uh, as I said, it, it's changed dramatically over the last years and uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, I will use these social media networks every now and then as a purpose of illustration to show you what I mean by, by the individual concepts that I'd like to talk about. Uh, but I will also highlight the differences of these social media <coughs> networks as compared to the concept of social networks in a more general sense. Now what these networks are and what these networks do is, is obviously quite familiar to, to most of you and you can use uh, graphical representations of this. This is a picture uh, from a Twitter network so you can see um, you can see regional clusters, you can see linkages between clusters. This is another representation where you can add pictures. And uh, a final one is this one from Facebook concerning communication ties in the context of the presidential election in the United States. Now, as I said, it's, it's changed quite dramatically. When I started to work on social networks some almost two decades ago, Social networks were seen as something, as a, as a means of conspiracy, something negative. And when I did my first studies, people were really hesitant to talk about their relational ties to others, both in uh, companies as well as in other contexts. So the, I have a twofold aim, as I mentioned today. The first is I would like to introduce you to the basic concepts and the basic mechanisms of social networks, and I will point uh, or I, I will put a specific emphasis on, on the question what we don't really know about these mechanisms. And, and secondly, as I said, I will show you why I believe that these social media networks that have become so prominent today uh, just represent a fairly small fraction of the much larger concept uh, of social networks in, in a more general sense. So this is my agenda. In the first part of the talk I will I will address the question of what actually is a social network, what are we talking about if we refer to social networks, so talk about the constitutional elements of these networks as well as different types of networks. Then I will look into different kinds of effects uh, that social networks may have and I will specifically focus on three different aspects. One is network size, then tie strength and finally network position. And finally I will critical critically review the matter of what are the benefits of social networks. What does it mean to be embedded in a network and what are the benefits both to individual actors as well as the collective system. So first of all my starting point is, and, and you've already realized that, that I believe this, the concept of social networks is much broader and much more general uh, as compared to the fairly tiny fraction of uh, concepts that apply to social media networks. Um, and, and one particular piece of evidence that can be used for this statement to support this statement is the fact that the concept of social network originates back to the 1930s of the last century uh, on the seminal uh, work of uh, David Moreno on, on graph theory. So basically the concept can be applied to a wide range of different phenomena that we may observe in, 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 in daily life. It could be friendship networks, it could be collaboration networks both among managers or co-authors in academia for example, it could be governance networks, interlocking directorates, a phenomenon that has often, addressed, uh, has often been addressed as the old boys networks of a national economy. Then there's a huge uh, area of research on the spread of 
infectious disease through networks, something like prostitute networks or drug networks, for example. Finally, it's been applied in the last years, obviously, to the matter of terrorist networks like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And this is just an, a very small number of examples where the concept can actually be used for. Now, in, in a very general sense, we could think of social networks nothing else but a representation of any kind of social structure. And if we apply this definition, we may say that any social network consists of two constitutional elements, one of them being the actors that can also be referred to as nodes of the network, and the other one is the relational ties that connect these actors together. And if we come from an from a overall structure, we may break down any kind of social network into the most fundamental component, which is the relational diet. Uh, or in other terms, it's, it's two prominent people in this network, two, two prominent actors, I and J. And these two individuals, or these two, these two nodes, are connected by a relational tie. And if we have a closer look into the kind of nodes that we address, we may say it most naturally it could be, oops, okay, here we are. I, sorry, it was my fault. Um, in the most natural way, we could think of individuals uh, as representing the nodes, but, but there are also other options. It could be animals, it could be objects, it could be social actors such as teams or companies or even nation states. And similarly, the range of possible ties that connect these actors can be, can be large. It could be kinship, it could be friendship, it could be collaboration, it could be the exchange of knowledge, it could be strategic alliances, strategic partnerships between companies, it could be trade relationships between countries. So if we consider the range of ties that is feasible, there are different ways to uh, have to, to more specifically distinguish them. So one way could be uh, the distinction between directed versus undirected ties. Some ties are natural, do not have a direction like kinship. If any two of us are related to each other, then it's, it's a non-directed way, whereas the transfer of information clearly has a source and, 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 uh, and, uh, or a sender and, and a receiver. It could be positive and negative ties. Uh, most ties are considered to be positive. Collaboration, for example, is something that we typically seek to do. Friendship is something positive, but if we consider competition ties among companies or even uh, ties such uh, implying hate or fear, then it, it may be also perceived as negative ties. It could be instrumental versus effective. Friendship ties is something that considers emotion and effect, whereas uh, the transfer of information and knowledge is purely instrumental. And some ties may be simply inherited. Uh, I'm a brother to someone else, not because I have chosen to do so, but it, it's just it's just happened to me. Whereas if I seek to build collaboration ties or friendship ties, the existence of a tie depend on the kind of behavior that I show. So if we go bottom up, we may say that networks start to emerge whenever we combine these relational ties uh, or the relational diets to one another. In other words, one of the key assumptions in social network research is that relational ties do not emerge independently from one another. And I have two examples where I show you what I mean by interdependence. Consider again the diet between I and J. So the transfer of information from actor I to actor J is most likely to, to depend on a reciprocated flow of information from J to I, because it's fairly unlikely that J will always be able to benefit without contributing to that, to that uh, diet. Another example would be a, a transitive triad, which can be most naturally explained in a friendship network where actor K, who is a friend of my friend actor J, is also likely to become my friend at, at some point in time. So we call that triadic closure, uh, and it's a, it's, it's a kind of structure that emerges over and over again. And you see, in, in such a configuration, the individual relationships become interdependent, or in other words, any one of these relationships is there or exists because there are other ties uh, in the network. And um, this is one of the occasions where I will use the social media networks as an example. Uh, and I've used my own Xing network to do so. This is me, Olaf. Um, and I have had an existing 
not a friend, whatever that is, an existing partner in my Xing network, Dr. Bode. And I, frankly speaking, I can't remember when we decided to connect, but eventually uh, we have met and decided to become partners on Xing. And uh, Dr. Bode himself has a partner who is Christian Lindner, and I don't know how long this contact has been, but obviously there might have been an occasion. And this is exactly the type of the friend of my friend. So in other words, there's a chain originating from me to Bode to Lindner, finally. For those of you who are not familiar with Mr. Lindner, he is the, he is the, um, the how do you call that, the, 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 the leader of the Liberal Party in Germany, Bundesvorsitzende. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, okay. Whatever, whatever the opinion is. And just for the purpose of this lecture, I thought I would try whether it works actually to facilitate transitive closure in this setting. So what I did last week, I sent an invitation to Mr. Lindner and it, it happened on December 7th, uh, 11.40 in the morning. And I thought, let's see what happens. And guess what? Only some 12 hours later, I became connected to Mr. Lindner. So this is an example of triadic closure in the sense that I just uh, represented. Even though I would like to say there are several differences as compared to the case of friendship that I was previously talking about. So there are several dimensions where we can distinguish the social media network from, from a true social network as I, uh, as I mentioned with the friendship ties. One is then the incentive to create ties. And the left-hand side, again, consider the friendship network. And in this case, I think K could become my friend just because I know J. And J is a good friend. And if J says K is a good friend, then I'm very likely to also think of, J, of K as my friend. Now, what is the mechanism in the Xing network, in the social media network? In other words, does Mr. Lindner even realize that there was some common friend that we may have? So what is the incentive to create an additional tie in the social media network? The second thing is, what is the content, content of relational ties? In a, in a social network, we may most, most naturally think of ties to be channels through which we transfer things such as resources, um, information, knowledge, emotions, feelings, and the like. But what does it mean to be connected to Mr. Lindner? What, what happens in this relational die? What, does, what is the relational content of this tie? Is it just an electronic click on the mouse or is it something else? And finally, again, if you think of a friendship networks, obviously we do have benefits from having friends. Friendship is something desirable and we like to have friends. But for those of you who have, you will know that having diets and establishing diets may also be associated with relational cost. So you need to establish the ties, you need to spend time with your friends. It, it may deserve some particular attention in order to build these ties. But what are the costs of establishing a connection on Xing or LinkedIn. It's just a mouse click away, and as you can see, it's easily responded, so I really doubt that there is something like cost. And I'll give you an additional example. I'm not sure whether you can see that, but on Xing, there's the number of total contacts, of total partners that someone has. And Mr. Linton is a fairly prominent person, having more than 13,300 contacts uh, or partners. And the question comes up, where are the costs of establishing ties if we can have so many of them? So basically my point is, on these social media networks, we can have relational ties virtually for free. And if you need to have more evidence, I tried additional parts. I thought maybe Mr. Linden was just a unique case. And I tried to connect to Mr. Tiefensee, who is a former federal minister, and it worked exactly the same way. And I tried to connect to Mr. Ms. Stoiblak Melin, and it also worked. So you can, add, you can add virtually an infinite number of additional people, even very prominent people, who are very much willing to instantaneously respond to your requests and get connected to you. So that leads to the question, what exactly does the social media network uh, represent? Now I'm going to talk about the effects of social network structure. First of all, network size. <coughs> Um, typically, if you look into the popular press, then you find these recommendations. You need to increase the size of your network. And what is meant by that is you should increase the number of your relational partners, build additional ties, uh, uh, basically. However, 
having talked about the interdependence of ties, we may say that it, a social network that not, does, does not only consist of the ties that you individually have, but it also captures the ties that your partners have. And by, you know, by connecting the ties together, we refer to a concept which is called indirect connectivity. And if we also consider the partners of our partners and their partners, again, the question that comes up is where does a network end? And Basically, my point is, networks are practically infinite, so it will also go on. There will always an additional partner going on in that, in that line. So, whenever we want to deal with any kind of network, a key question comes up: how to delineate the system that we, that we are looking at? Who are the actors that belong to these networks, and what are the relational ties that that we want to consider? And to give you an understanding of what I mean, this is a. This is a network of managers in a department of a company. And we start at the very center with this group of people. So these are all people who are directly connected to one another. It's, it's a one-step network, basically. But what happens if we increase the size of these circles? The further out we go, where do we stop <coughs> this? In this context, it was, there was a natural boundary, which is the department structure. So anyone who is within the department belongs to the network, and everyone who is not does obviously not belong. But what happens if we think in larger terms? And this is you or me, it doesn't matter. And if you think of your direct network partners in whatever kind of network you could think of, we can easily end up with something like this. So basically my message is that a network is an infinite system and it captures all the seven point something billion people living on Earth. And more surprisingly, this has been referred to as the small world phenomenon. It's only, on average, it's only six steps that you need to take to reach anyone in the world. Six steps, every, or in other words, everyone else is only six steps away from you individuals sitting here in this room. So basically, addressing global networks with more than seven billion actors may not be feasible for all kinds of questions that we might be interested in. So basically, as I said, what we commonly refer to the size of the network is the number of direct ties that we have. In other words, it's defined by an actor's degree. And this is another example here. You see, uh, it's, it's, it's a collaboration structure among senior managers in a multinational company. The blue ones are those working in subsidiaries and the yellow ones are those working in the corporate head offices. And obviously some of these managers are much stronger connected than others. We find central actors having many ties and peripheral actors having only a few ties. And here in the right, on the upper right corner you see an individual who has only two, two relational ties. So there are a number of things that we don't really know very well with respect to network size. So first question is, is it actually better to have more ties or is it better to have less ties? And uh, if there is something like, is there an ideal number of ties that we should have? Um, and does this ideal number of ties vary with respect to the kind of network we are addressing. So does it make a difference whether we look into friendship networks or whether we look into collaboration networks? Um, and if we look into entire systems, where do we draw the boundaries of an existing network that we address? So what is, what is an appropriate way to delineate the, the structure that we are interested in? And again, the argument was Mr. Lindner having 13,000 partners, what does that actually mean? Is it good to have so many partners or would it be more advisable to reduce the number of partners? The second thing I'd like to talk about is tie strength and obviously some types, uh, some types of ties are naturally binary in nature. So you're either related or not, kinship ties, or you're either married or not, uh, or you are either a member of a club or you are not. So it's either or, it's only zero and one. Whereas other ties can be differentiated according to their strength, uh, trade relationships between countries in monetary units, or the strength of friendship. We could differentiate between acquaintanceship, good friends, romantic friendship, and love. Or finally, uh, the frequency in collaborative interaction between any two individuals, like rarely, occasionally, often, frequently, and the like. Um, 
again, to give you some idea what I mean by that, these are the collaboration ties among the set of managers I was just talking about. And these are, these are all ties, so it's strong and weak ties, or in other words, frequent and, and occasional interaction. Now, if we look into the strong ties only, only the frequent interactions, the network becomes much sparser. And uh, even more interestingly, it starts to collapse into two separate components, a small component on the left-hand side and a fairly strong and giant component on the right-hand side. So you see, obviously, tie strength has something to do with network density or with the number of ties that people have. People, have, people seem to have more weak ties than strong ties, obviously. Intuitively, strong ties seem to be more desirable. We want to have good friends or we want to have close collaboration partners. But at least in theory, there are strong arguments against only having strong ties. And I've, I've uh, put some up here. So in effective, in effective uh, friendship networks, for example, how many good friends do you really want to have? And there might be a common sense about the number of romantic relationships that an individual should have. So having more than a single one may cause problems, let's put it that way. Um, the same is true for instrumental ties like information networks. So the high frequency of interaction among individuals is likely to lead to redundancy. If you talk to someone each individual day, it's very unlikely that you get any kind of new information from this person rather than just talking occasionally to him. And this has been put forward in a very seminal paper by Granovetter uh, more than 40 years ago, the strength of weak ties. So he proposed that weak ties are particularly strong as compared to strong ties. Nevertheless, there are a number of things that we don't know with, with respect to tie strength. Um, one of them, under which conditions are strong ties better than weak ties or vice versa? Um, how many strong or weak ties should an actor typically have? Is there an ideal relationship between strong and weak ties? So. Uh, relative to each other. And again, in social media networks, what do strong or weak ties mean with, re with that respect? I'm connected to Mr. Lindner, but is this a strong tie? Is it a weak tie? Or is it just a tie? Uh, we don't know. And another question that comes up, if you have thousands of ties, is it actually feasible to have strong ties at all? Finally, network position is, is an important thing, and I'm sorry, there seems to be one relational tie that has dropped on the slide. Uh, it was supposed not to be here. Um, th there's an ongoing debate what kind of position, what kind of embeddedness is more, uh, more favorable to actors. Uh, and, and there are two underlying concepts that can be distinguished. One is the, the concept of network closure. So the proposition is that if you're embedded in a dense network where everyone is connected to everyone else, it increases the level of trust, it increases the level of intimacy, and from increasing these aspects, the kind of information that you transfer between people is more, is more useful, is, 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 is more desirable to achieve. Um, alternatively, there has been uh, the idea of brokerage in networks. So. Uh, the concept of structural holes argues that if you are M, if you are the broker in the mid of the structure, you are much better able to benefit from your position because you can sort of outplay your, your partner. So in other words, all your partners depend on you whether they want to get access to the resources that other partners will have. And there's also real world evidence for both types of structures. Again, this is a network among all Asian Pacific managers in a multinational corporation. And it seems to be fairly well connected and fairly dense. So it's not that everyone talks to everyone else, but at least there are no separate components. There's nothing like brokership in there. So everyone is well embedded in this network. Uh, second uh, example, this is again collaboration among managers of a single subsidiary where all people seem to be well connected with all others uh, and a large number of ties connecting these, these actors together. On the other hand, this is two subsidiaries in a single country of another company and you see this is a clear evidence for brokerage where the only connection between the two subsidiaries uh, uh, is through two individual managers. And if their connections, for whatever reason, breaks, then it's very likely that these two subsidiaries get it, get getting completely separate from one another. Or a second argument, <coughs> brokerage among um, multinational companies tends 10 most important subsidiaries. And again, you can find 
evid strong evidence for brokership in many occasions. Um, some of these actors seem to be well connected, just as here, whereas we find brokerage here, we have one here, we have one here. So it seems to be a mixture between the two things. And even if we look into entire structure where brokerage does not seem to be to be uh, an, an important mechanism, if we do it the analytic way, and uh, in this picture, the, the size of, of a node reflects his extent of or his or her extent of brokerage. You see that in this in this case, the central departments of that company that have obviously a strong brokerage position in that network. So even in well-connected structures, we do find evidence for brokerage as well. Nevertheless, there are a number of things we do not really know very well. And, and first of all, do brokers actually know that they are brokers? Or does it happen to them? Do they accidentally uh, obtain a position as brokers? And are actors also aware of their partner's position? Um, is either of the two kinds of network structure universally better than the other one? Uh, we could easily think of, uh, for example, that in a friendship network, closure seems to be desirable. If the friends that I have are also friends, then I can meet with everyone uh, at once. If, they are, if I'm a broker, I, I don't see a strong reason why I would want to be a broker in a friendship network. Whereas in an information network, a knowledge network, brokerage seems to have a different a different uh, um, uh, kind of importance. And which kind of network position is desirable if actors are simultaneously embedded in effective and instrumental networks? So if they are friends and collaboration partners at the same time. Uh, and we know that there's a strong positive uh, intercorrelation between the two types of networks. The better you understand each other, the more likely you are friends, the better you typically tend to collaborate. And again, with respect to the social media networks, previously Dr. Bode used to be the broker between Mr. Lindner and me. And the first question is, has he been aware of being a broker before that? And does the triadic closure make any kind of change or does it make any kind of difference to him? And what does it mean to be a broker in these social media networks? Obviously, Mr. Linton was proposed to me because he was the contact of my contact. But what does brokerage mean in these social media networks? I'm not sure on that. In the remainder of my talk, I would like to address some benefits of networks. So obviously, networks are not just there for fun. And at least if you, if you believe what the popular press tells you, then there must be a deeper sense of being uh, embedded in networks. Um, so often it's proposed to, uh, or it's proposed that actors strongly benefit from being a part of a network. And the relation ties represent channels facilitating the transfer of resources, as I said, information, advice, friendship. So obviously the number of ties will have an effect on how much you, your utility in these networks may be. Uh, or in other terms, we may say, if we want to acquire these resources, if we want to have friends, if we want to acquire advice, if we want to get knowledge from others, we need to build ties to others. So ties are the, 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 the most important aspects in, in getting these, uh, these um, kinds of resources. And basically, what we should expect is that an actor's utility of his or her network should be a function of both the number of ties that he or she has, as well as the type of position I was previously talking about, being a broker or being embedded in a closed network. Um, however, what we may say is that social structure and therefore social networks simultaneously satisfy several needs. And uh, we typically, in, in analytic terms, we refer to that as the multiplexity of social structures. So in other words, there is a strong interrelationship between instrumental and effective ties. And I will give you an example here. Um, it's collaborating with colleagues by exchanging knowledge simultaneously affects, uh, uh, facilitates uh, affiliation needs. Or in other words, we are more likely to collaborate with those whom we consider to be our friends. So friendship could be an antecedent to collaboration. Or in other terms, we could think of if any two of us have been collaborating for a long time, over time we also start to 
become friends. So both friendship and collaboration can be antecedents as well as consequences of the respective other type of tie. And the next question comes up, how is utility defined in a network? If we look into a structure like this, where does the utility come from? And obviously, this network reflects the transfer of resources, but what happens if we change the structure of that network? If we added additional actors or if we remove ties, would that make any changes to the overall level of utility? So would alternative structural configuration result in different levels of utility of this kind of network? And if we talk about benefits, we should differentiate between two different levels. One is the actor level and obviously the two brokers on the left picture, if we are on the actor level, the two brokers may benefit in different terms from the network as compared to the more peripheral actors. Uh, if it's an instrumental network, we may say, yes, they have an information advantage over their, over their colleagues. Uh, and if it's an effective network, we could critically ask whether it's, it's uh, desirable to be a broker in a friendship network. But nevertheless, it's, it's fairly easy to understand that there might be a difference in the way of, the, of how these actors benefit from their ties. Now, if we go on the network level, we do see the distinction between well-connected actors in the center as well as peripherally connected actors in, uh, at, at the edge of this network. But what is the overall benefit of this structure? Is it work well? Does it work well? Or is there room for improvement? We don't really know yet. So if we look into the act on, the, on the actress level, we may say that there's an abundance of articles in magazines, how to uh, improve your network uh, and how important these networks are, specifically with respect to success in Korea. <coughs> There are networking events of companies, associations, like the meet and greet things where you get together, you learn to know new people and hopefully you build ties with them, whatever ties means. Uh, and finally, the awareness of networks has become an increasingly important part of uh, human resource development. So companies increasingly facilitate things such as uh, network trainings, network workshops, because they believe that their employees should sort of move more closely together. However, the realization of these individual level at, uh, benefits depends on several requirements. Um, one of them is, does the actor know what he or she wants to achieve from his network position? In other words, how do I as an individual actor define the utility of my network? The second question is, do I know where I am in my network? Am I a broker or am I a peripheral uh, person in that network? Uh, how well am I able to access the position of my fellows, of, of my partners, and how much are these partners aware of their position as well as my position? In other words, do they allow me to be a broker or do they take sort of counteraction? And how much do people actually uh, know about the mechanisms that relate to individual positions? On the network level, we would probably apply different dimensions of utility. So a consideration could be how homogeneously or how heterogeneously are actors embedded into this network. Do we seek to be people, or do we seek people to be differently embedded or do we want to achieve a fairly homogeneous spread of individual ties across all actors? Another consideration could be the diffusion speed. So how much time is required if I want to spread some piece of information in this network and I just, just put an infection in one point, one note, how long does it take for everyone to receive that kind of information? Um, a third argument could be how costly is it to maintain or to build a network that actually facilitates the kind of benefits that we seek to, to achieve. Um, and finally, is there something like a benchmark? Um, how does the social network, how is the social network supposed to work? And this is something that, that I find quite surprising when I work with companies, that they don't really have an understanding of what they want to achieve with a network. They, they don't have really an idea of how their network is supposed to look like. We just want to improve it. We don't know how, and we don't know how it's supposed to look like, but we want to improve it. So what makes it even more complex is that 
the two levels seem to be interrelated. So basically, and, and you may have realized that the kind of structure that we see on the on the on the, on the aggregated scale depends on the individual level behavior that that actors perform. So there is an interdependence between the individual network strategies of each actor in the network as well as the network level benefits. Well, in other words, we could ask the question, is utility something, something like a zero-sum game? So the more I benefit from my position, the less my partners are able to benefit from their position. Is utility spread equally or unequally within that network? And again, to give you an idea here, we may say that these brokers seem to have an advantage, but questions that come up is then, is it good or is it bad to have brokers in your network? There are strong arguments for brokerage, but there may also be strong arguments against brokerage. We don't know. And if brokerage is desirable, how much brokerage would we seek to have? How many brokers should there ideally be in this network? And if brokers understand about the power of their position, what can we as an organization, what can we do in order to prevent them from behaving opportunistically or opportunistically make use of the position that they have? Because it's clear if a person like this or a person like this quits the company or decides not to continue you know, transferring resources, it's very likely that the entire structure falls apart and that a considerable number of actors become disconnected from the rest. And actually this may have happened up here. So this is a, a disconnected component of the network. So whatever kind of information you start sending out here, it will never get to these people up here. Just to conclude, um, Humans are social animals and therefore networks, social networks are important and are a very important aspect in daily life. Um, it happens all over, all over time and all over place and all over different occasions. Um, it, social networks can be seen as both antecedents and consequences of human behavior. So the more we know about these networks, the better we may be able to predict how people will behave. For example, with respect to their career advancements, with respect to how collaboration uh, works within organizations or how successful football teams may be, um, we don't know. And I hope that I've given you an understanding of why I think the social media networks are, just represent a very special fraction of all kinds of social networks that we actually do see in daily life. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm-mm. <clears throat>